Today, I wanna to tell you about the six ways that you can stabilize or halt fermentation in your homebrew. So let's get started. So yes, there are six ways you can do this. And the way I'm structuring this video is level one or most beginner friendly to level six, which is the least beginner friendly, more difficult. And I understand as I go through this, some of you guys are gonna say, well, I, I think this one's more difficult than this. And I'll be honest, I don't really care. I've layered this how I wanna do this. You can disagree with me. You can say it's a different uh, order, but here are six ways you can do it in a beginner to pro or expert or difficult sort of way. Number one is very simple and it is to fortify your mead. So if I say mead, I'm really talking about wine or beer or cider. This is useful for any of these, but I make a lot of mead. So generally most of you watching are probably mead makers. Fortifying is the process of adding a spirit of sorts to increase the ABV of your brew. Generally you do this if you want to either pass the possible ABV cap that the yeast has, or if you just want to make your mead wine cider more strong. Like if you made something at 16% and you wanted to get it to 25 for some reason, you could fortify it. You could also use this to halt fermentation. Let's say I made a, well, I'm gonna use this mead in front of me. This is a grapefruit mead and it sets about 11%. The yeast I used here had the ability to go past 11%. Let's say I arrived at 11%, there was still sugar for the yeast to consume. If I went through and dumped a bunch of vodka or whiskey or Everclear or some sort of spirit to increase the ABV past that point to the point where the yeast are hitting their cap, let's say 14%, it should halt fermentation because the yeast most of the time will stop when they get to their cap. Now, the difficulty there is you might add your spirit and they won't stop because maybe they reach 14.5%. There are calculators to help you figure out your ABV slash how much of the fortifying side you need to go through, how much you need to add. So I can include a fortifying calculator below, but that's level one. It's super easy because you literally do nothing other than find out where your ABV is, and then you add a bunch of like liquor and until it stops fermenting or use that calculator. All right, here's a quick explainer on fortifying, and here's a calculator you can see. It's on screen right now. It's this blending calculator from Mead Tools, which I'm gonna put I'll link in the description below. Under value one that you see here, what you're gonna put is your ABV of whatever you have. Let's say you have your mead wine, whatever, is 13%. Underneath value two is the ABV of your spirit. So if it's a 90 proof, it's gonna be 45%, whatever you have. Under the volume one, you're gonna put the amount of liquid there. This is in gallons right here. So this is one gallon of value one. So my one gallon of mead at 13%. Volume two. This is where you gotta plug and play a little bit to hit your ABV tolerance or pass it. You're gonna have to plug in the numbers. Let's say that I wanted to get this to 15.5%. Let's see how much 45% liquor I'm gonna have to add. I'm gonna put 0.07. That gets me to 15.09, so not quite what I need. So let's say 09, I wanna to get to 15 and a half. Okay, so 0 0.09 gallons of 45% alcohol. Obviously the higher your alcohol you choose, the less it is. Let's choose something like um, a really high proof rum that's like 75%. At that same amount, that kicks me up to 18%. So I need way less of my rum to get me there. So that's how you use the fortifying calculator. If you do this, super easy, quick way to stabilize slash halt fermentation. Does this work for low ABV meads? Meaning that could you make a 7% mead that stops sweet? No, absolutely not. When you add that spirit, you're increasing the ABV, therefore taking away all of that opportunity to make this a low ABV mead wine cider. So you can't use this for low ABV things, but you can do it for higher. All right, so after editing this video, having some conversations with my Discord, I realized number one might not be the most friendly version. Really, I probably should have offset this a little bit. Fortifying works well. 
but is it the most beginner friendly if you don't know how to do that math or use the calculator? No. Just letting you know, I understand people in the comments are going to start saying blah, 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 whatever. So fortifying works, probably not the most beginner friendly, but alas, here we are after the fact, and I've already redone the video before. So that's what you get. Level two, a little more difficult, but not really that difficult, is using potassium sorbate and potassium metabisulfite. These two things are used in conjunction to halt fermentation. Now, specifically, I'm talking about in this instance, we'll talk about a different way to do it later, but the fermentation ends. Let's say you've created your beer, mead, wine, cider. It gets to the end of its fermentation. There's still room to go, and let's say the yeast can still ferment. If you will let that fermentation end, add potassium sorbate, which is essentially it, it does not let the yeast bud anymore or create more of themselves and halts that side of fermentation. The potassium metabisulfite, also known as Camden tablets, takes away all the oxygen. Between the oxygen getting pulled out of the brew and the inability to bud and produce more yeast themselves, they will stop fermenting. Now this only works well if you've racked off of the yeast for the most part. There can be a few little yeasty particles in there, but if you ferment, you get to the end of fermentation and then you just throw that potassium sorbate metabisulfite in while it's room temperature, it's not gonna work. The yeast will fight back. So that room temperature side is just very important that you rack off the yeast first. But once it's been stabilized via those two things, you're free to add whatever you want to it. More honey, more sugar, more whatever. It will be stabilized if you use the proper amount of potassium sorbate and metabisulfite. There are calculators, and I'll put one below, to figure out how much metabisulfite and sorbate you need to add in order for it to be stabilized. Does this work for low alcohol brews? Yes, it does. Because your brew, let's say you've planned ahead, you wanted it to ferment out from whatever 1.058 to 1.000 and you have yourself an 8% is that 8% roughly 8% mead or beer or wine cider this point you can just add those things in and you could back sweeten and do your thing so it does work for low alcohol brews i do it quite a bit it works well we're going deeper level three talking about pasteurization pasteurization is the process of heating the liquid up and essentially killing the yeast because you're putting them out into this hot sun sort of situation and they just die. Now there is a whole chart of pasteurization times and temperatures that I'm gonna put up that you can see. Essentially what you need to know is you have to ensure you get the right temperature for the right amount of time. Otherwise the yeast will not truly die off. Therefore, they won't stop. How do you pasteurize? You can pasteurize in bottles Generally, you don't want to do this in corked bottles because the heat will shoot the corks out. You can do it in big carboys, a gallon, three, five gallon carboys, if you have the ability to put it into a big enough container to do this. Most people will do it with a sous vide. Some people will do it on the stove, but it's with water surrounding a container. You heat the water surrounding the container to the temperature you need for the amount of time you need you make sure the internal temperature of the liquid is the right thing as well, and you have pasteurized or killed off the yeast. When can you do this? You can do this at any point. Let's say you made a brew, it's a week has gone by in fermentation, you taste it and you go, I like where that's at. I like the sweetness level that's at, and I don't wanna worry about trying to use any of these other methods. At that point, all you do is you can put them the brew into bottles or into that carboy and you pasteurize it and that will halt it in the literal moment it will stop it right there if you do it correctly the yeast will no longer be alive therefore they cannot ferment does this work for low alcohol brews it does it works very well my cautionary thing with this is and people have had mixed results if you do this with glass which we all pretty much use glass all the time sometimes glass can have little imperfections if there's any air bubbles in your glass or something like that, when you heat the container up, there's a chance that that air bubble will expand. It could crack or break the glass. I've heard of people who have had lots of blowouts, for lack of a better term, of carboys, where they've been pasteurizing in a one gallon container or something large, and then that glass cracks in the water because it got too hot too quick or something, and they lose their whole brew. Now, some people have never had that problem sort of a mixed bag. 
but I've seen a lot more of the failure side than I have the successes. Pasteurization works well. It doesn't, with all of these, I should say, there is no altering of flavors from my experience. I have not tasted any altered flavors, but I am going to do a test in the future of pasteurization versus potassium sorbate metabisulfite because I know people are interested to see if those have varying taste differences. All right, we're going to level four. This one is where it gets a little more difficult and it's mostly a money thing. There's this thing called sterile filtering. Lots of wineries, meaderies, places in the world will filter their brew from one place to another. Essentially, they run it through this, what's called microns, a super tiny little mesh screen through a, a certain size micron to filter out a lot of yeast, particles, stuff like that. Now, specifically to sterile filter, you have to get down to 0.45 microns or smaller, which is very small. Lots of uh, wine or mead filtration systems are generally like one to two microns, sometimes up to five microns, which is still small, but not sterile filter small. At that 0.45 micron ratio that the yeast cannot make it through that filter, therefore, once the brew's out into the next container, they're gone. So that's the way you can do it. This one is level four because it's expensive. You have to have extra equipment and not really a beginner friendly thing. I wanna make sure and highlight that the first three are pretty beginner friendly. They don't really require a much equipment or anything extra. It's just, you let it go, you just do it. Level four, you do have to have the equipment to be able to filter down like that. So if you wanna do that, by all means, please do. But I just don't think the normal home brewer is gonna have that at their fingertips to be able to do that. Does it work for low alcohol brews? Of course. Whenever that brew hits the point you like, you go ahead and run it through that filter, and then there you go. You've halted fermentation because the yeast are stuck over here. You got your filtered brew right here. However sweet you want it, however dry it's supposed to be, whatever you do, it's now totally stabilized. All right, level five, we're getting deep in here. This is all about I hesitated to kind of put this on here, but it is a true one. There's an extra layer to it. You can cap out your yeast to halt fermentation. So in my brain, the idea of halting is like your car is going along and then it stops. This is like your car is going along and it slows down and then it gets to a final stop. There wasn't really like a sudden cutoff, you're done. So it's not really halting fermentation. You're just planning ahead in a way. What you need to know to do this, you need to know your yeast alcohol by volume cap, the highest point that they can ferment to. Now this number can be stretched. Let's say you have a 14% yeast and you plan your numbers to where it's supposed to end at 14.5%. There's a good chance that that little 0.5% will continue to be fermented on, that the yeast, if they're happy and healthy, will ferment through that. So you have to generally go further than that sometimes. Let's say that you wanted to stop at that 14%, roughly, you might shoot and say, well, I need to get enough sugar to get up to 16%. And more than likely, you might hit that cap. But also, yeast could still do what they want. They could still be happy and healthy and ferment on through, and you could have yourself a 15.5% brew and not the level of sugar you wanted. Now, there is something interesting here. There's a thing called Dell units. It's pretty deep, to be honest. Dell units... If you know how to use them, you can figure out if your brew is stable. So for example, just capping out your yeast, meaning you let it ferment until it stops, is not always a surefire way to say it's done. Does it work a lot? Yes. Sometimes if you fermented, let's say you got all the way from your 14% yeast landed at 14% or 14.5%, and you had some residual sugar. There's a chance, because I've had this happen to me before, that your yeast will kick back up if they're feeling healthy or feisty, that they just had a little dormancy period. This could be introduction of more oxygen. When you rack it, you could do something to where the yeast say, ah, actually, I'm not done. You've capped out the yeast, technically, right? Because you've reached past their ABV, but they're still able to go along because yeast are finicky, and they do kind of what they want. I had this happen to me recently with a blueberry and cinnamon mead. I, I make one called the Rhapsody in Blue. It's a really good recipe. I did that exactly. I capped out the yeast, to my knowledge, 
I had it at a sweetness level that I was like, this is great. This is good. Love it. I had moved it into um, a container, a new container, and it started re-fermenting again. That, because the oxygen had kicked back up and the yeast said, hey, I got more fuel. I got more oxygen here. I got more spunk. I don't know what they had, but they kicked back up. And then I had fermentation again. But I'd capped them out. So the important thing here is it's a little bit finicky. There's a way you can actually do this, though. It's called del units. If there is enough or a high enough del unit based off your ABV, your final gravity, those yeast shouldn't kick back up because there is too much there. There's enough sugar content there that they, they will not go ahead and start up again. Now, how do you calculate del units? This is the hard part. So we're gonna start with the, the formula. It's 4.5 times the ABV of the brew plus your residual sugar. Now, let's the first two are easy, 4.5 times your ABV. Let's say 4.5 times 14%. Easy, right? Residual sugar, that's a little bit harder to figure out. So to find your residual sugar, we have to calculate, we have to use a calculator generally. Now, there are calculations, but I'm just gonna put a calculator below. You put two numbers in. Generally, you put the starting gravity. Let's say you started at 1.120. You ended at 1.010. If you go ahead and hit the button, it will tell you the residual sugar you have. Now, that's helpful. That's great to know. But that doesn't tell us our del units. We don't know if it's actually stable or if it's going to referment based off of our capping of the yeast. So from here, we now have to take that residual sugar number and we're going to divide it by 10. So we take whatever that number is, divide by 10, and we go back to the original formula we talked about. So this is plugging in our number we missed. We had 4.5 times 14% plus the residual sugar. So I don't have the calculated number right here, but that's the del units. How do we know if that's enough del units? Well, this is also where people have done some research in the past, specifically um, there's some people on Reddit that have done some stuff, and I'm going to read kind of from them. They said, for a 14% mead, according to Simmons, you need at least 1.00 final gravity in a stable reading to prevent restarts. In the port and wine world, there's a whole different slew of things, though. They say that they need at least 73 points of Dell units at that 14% ratio for it to be stable, which is a final gravity of 1.037. You see, that's a big discrepancy. We have 1.006, according to our original number, in the port and wine world, 1.037. I'm inclined to lean toward the latter number because that first one is not quite enough. That's That, to me, says those yeast would still be able to go along. An important thing here says, Dell units and Dell calculations are only valid if fermentation has actually paused either artificially, which artificially is cold crashing. We're going to talk about that in a second. Or Camden tablets slash potassium sorbate to halt. So your fermentation pausing. We talked earlier about capping out the yeast. You've fermented as far as they can go. If you want to check out your Dell units, you plug in this equation. There's some calculators below. You ensure that you are staying above the Dell units you need and it should be stable. If it's below that number, there's a chance that those yeast could kick back up because it's not totally stable. That's really deep. Does this work for low ABV meads? No, because generally you're capping out yeast and capping out yeast most of the time is 10% or above. I don't know of really any yeast that halts below 10%. So that's not low ABV in my world. Our final one is the most complex and the most risky. And many people have talked about this. I, I have nothing against it. I just want beginners to be safe, and I worry that beginners won't do this correctly. So there's a thing called cold crashing. Cold crashing is the process of cooling down the liquid whenever it hits a certain point. So let's say we're fermenting, we hit the sweetness level that we want, we take our whole container, we put it in the fridge. When you do this, yeast, junk starts to fall to the bottom and they go dormant. They stop for the moment as a temporary thing. If you were to pull that out of the fridge, and just let it be, it would kick back up and start fermenting again. Get off all of those yeast. It should, keyword, should halt fermentation. Because you've gotten rid of the yeast, you've stabilized it in the process, there's not enough of a yeast colony now, if you've racked it off of that yeast colony, and it should be done fermenting. 
But if you don't get rid of the full yeast colony, and that sorbate and metabisulfite aren't strong enough to fight against the current yeast colony, that yeast colony will win. They'll come up and they'll start fermenting again. So the racking side is super important. You might even have to clear the mead or wine or cider before you do this, meaning you add some clearing agent to drop everything out at that point. So going back, ferment along, reach the sweetness level, reach the point you want the brew to be done, cold crash it, put it to a cold chamber, let things fall to the bottom, rack it into a new container as many times as you need until you get off all of the dead yeast, or dormant yeast, I should say. Stabilize it, potassium sorbate, metabisulfite, this whole time it's cold. And then let it sit for a little bit longer, make sure that there's no more yeast at the bottom. It should be stable, it should be all right. That one is sketchy because if you do it wrong, the yeast will just kick back up. Not necessarily a beginner thing I would recommend, which is why it's level six. Does it work for low alcohol brews? Yes, it does. You can definitely do that. So we've discussed six ways to do this. Level one through six. Level one, simple. Level six is difficult. There's math. There's equipment involved. Those are your options. I'm sure that someone's going to come through the woodwork and say, you missed one. And I, you know what? Maybe I did. And I apologize. But those are the six I'm going to recommend. If you're a beginner, stick with one of the first three. Really, if you're a beginner, I recommend you stick with number two and number three. Number one works well, but it changes the flavor of your brew. And for me, I don't really want my grapefruit mead right here to taste like a spirit. I want it to taste like my grapefruit and all of those things. So number two and number three are my preferred. Everything else works as well, but it it's not as beginner friendly. I'm easy, I can easily do all of these, but I choose to do number two, number three, and really number five sometimes. I never sterile filter because I don't have the equipment to do it. And I don't always do the cold crashing potassium sorbate mix because I don't necessarily feel like I need to, although it's not a bad method. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've learned something through this. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the future. Cheers.